Hello again, everyone. My name is Marion Fourcade, and I am the director of Social Science Matrix at UC Berkeley. And I am very pleased to welcome you to today's Matrix on Point panel, Religion in the Age of Information. This is a panel that is uh, jointly organized by Social Science Matrix and the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion. And it is also co-sponsored by the Berkeley Center for New Media. So the panel today will focus on how digital technologies are transforming both religious doctrines and religious uh, practices. For those of you who are new to Social Science Matrix, we are a cross-disciplinary social science research institute at UC Berkeley. And today's event is a part of our Matrix on Point series, an event series that is devoted to panel discussions on important matters of the moment. So let me just mention a few upcoming events. On November 10th, we have a virtual panel on the labor of firefighting. On November 16th, an author meets critics with Sai Bala Krishnan, uh, assistant professor uh, in the Department of City and Regional Planning. And on December 3rd, we have another author meets critics events with Neil Flickstein from Berkeley Sociology Department. And finally, our last matrix on point of the semester will be on December 13th on democracy, misogyny, and digital media. So now uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the moderator and co-organizer actually of today's panel. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Carolyn Chen. Um, she's Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. She's the author of Getting Saved in America, Taiwanese Immigration and Religious Experience, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2008. And she's the co-editor of Sustaining Faith Traditions, Religion, Race and Ethnicity Among the Latino and Asian American Second Generation, published by NYU Press in 2012. And I'm very excited actually that about her forthcoming book, uh, Work, Pray, Code, When Work Becomes Religion in Silicon Valley, which is forthcoming next spring uh, from Princeton University Press. And we are actually will have an author meets critic panel, I believe in end, end of April or, or early May on this book. So Caroline, uh, uh, without further ado, I turn uh, to you uh, for uh, this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for that uh, generous introduction. Well, good afternoon. Um, today, we turn to the topic of religion in the age of information. Um, so new technology has changed, even transformed the way that people have practiced religion throughout history, from the role of the printing press in the Protestant Reformation to television and the spread of televangelism, to the role of the internet and apps today, such as Pope Francis's e-rosary app or religious dating apps such as JDate for single Muslim, um, and so many meditation and prayer apps that are available today. Technology is changing how we practice religion, when we practice religion, and is changing our notions of religious community, religious doctrine, and what it means to be religious. Um, and certainly um, our dependence on religion, on technology for communal religious practice has only been accelerated in the last year and a half due to the pandemic. Well, today we have a distinguished panel of speakers who are gonna share their research and their thoughts on how new technology is changing religion. Um, so if you don't mind, speakers, if you could just show your faces as I introduce you. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. Heather Melquis Leto. She is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict at Arizona State University. She is a cultural anthropologist who work, whose work attends to the intersections of technology, religion, and kinship in South Korea and the United States. Her book manuscript, Holy Infrastructure, draws on over two years of ethnographic research to demonstrate the co-construction of Christianity and media technology in some of the first transnational multi-site churches in the world. Welcome, Dr. Melquis Leto. Our second speaker will be Dr. Stephen Barry Anthony. He is a researcher, teacher, and author in the area of contemporary American religion and public life. 
He is director and principal investigator of public theologies of technology and presence of programs supported by the Henry Luce Foundation that gathers and funds leading scholars of religion and journalists for projects examining technology's impact on human relationships. Dr. Barry Anthony was, a, was formerly a staff writer with LA Times where he developed the technology and culture beat. He is a visiting scholar with the Berkeley Center for Study of Religion and has a psychotherapy practice in the Bay Area. Welcome, Stephen. Dr. Erica Galt is an assistant, assistant professor of Africana Studies at the University of Arizona. She is a scholar, poet, and ordained elder whose justice-centered work blends religion, art, and um, whose research blends art and religion to advocate for the rights of young Black people. Dr. Galt's work focuses on the intersection of religious history, technology, and urban Black life in post-industrial America. She's the co-editor of Beyond Christian Hip Hop, Towards Christians and Hip Hop. Her new book, Networking the Black Church, Digital Black Christians and Hip Hop, will be published by NYU Press this January. Very excited about that. Welcome, Erica. Finally, um, Dr. Kelsey Burke, um, is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she studies the relationship between sexuality and religion in contemporary America. She's the author of Christians Undercovers, Evangelicals and Sexual Pleasure on the Internet, and author of the forthcoming book, The Pornography Wars, The Past, Present, and Future of America's Obscene Obsession. What a great title. Thank you. Um, welcome, Dr. Kelsey, um, Dr. Kelsey Burke. So why don't we begin first um, with uh, Dr. Melquis Leto, and we'll go in this order with Heather, Stephen, Erica, followed by Kelsey. Thank you, Caroline, for the introduction um, and for organizing this panel. I'm really honored to be here as a UC Berkeley PhD alum. It's a, it's a real pleasure. So I, as she said, I am a sociocultural anthropologist and I research religion, media, and technology through ethnographic field research in South Korea and the, the Korean diaspora. Today, I'm going to draw on work from my first book project, which focused on technology in transnational multi-site churches. So a multi-site church is essentially a single church that meets at multiple locations, often by recording a worship service at one location and broadcasting it to so-called satellite campuses. Um, since about the 2000s, nearly all American church, mega churches have become multi-site, have adopted this more franchise-like model. And for this reason, um, American churches have been seen as sort of a pioneer of this new model. Uh, however, as I found in my research, the first multi-site churches in the world were actually based in Seoul, South Korea, beginning in the 1980s. And in fact, um, I found that many of the somewhat, the so-called pioneering churches in the United States actually drew deliberately on the models of certain South Korean churches in my studies. And so I mentioned this just to say for people in my audience here who might be a little more familiar with the American multi-site church, um, which is a fairly new phenomenon, a lot can be learned by looking also at its predecessor in South Korea. So in my comments here, um, I want to first flag that there is a level of technological determinism that is sort of built into our common sense notion of technology. It's partly because the word technology often connotes change, while religion often connotes traditionalism, that the ways in which technological objects affect religion can seem most apparent or intuitive, but that influence is, of course, not just unidirectional in the way that the common narrative implies. And we might even think about the way that these categories are not as distinct from one another um, uh, as we might think sometimes. So today I'm going to offer one story from my research that highlights what I sometimes call the coordination of religious and technological innovation within South Korean multi-site churches. This will serve to highlight more generally how religious ideas and practices inform technological ideas and practices and not just vice versa. Um, the case will also offer what I find to be a challenge to contemporary conversations about algorithms and ethics. Um, but in general, hopefully it illustrates why the study of religion um, should remain a critical element to understanding information technology use within people's everyday lives. Okay, here's my story. Hallelujah, 
shouted the older man on the stage. And with that, the lights turned on, rousing us from our prayer at the first meeting of the Information Technology Mission School at Onri Church in Central Seoul. The speaker was Go Gun, a professor of computer science, the former president of a small university near Jeonju, and an elder at Onri Church. As an introductory talk for the program, his presentation was meant to excite us about doing ministries through information technology. I expected a sermon, but what he offered was an academic lecture instead. Drawing on Max Weber's famous thesis of the elective affinity between Protestantism and rational capitalist development, his lecture argued that South Korean Christians had a unique calling to become IT missionaries. Weber, he said, had demonstrated the close relationship between Protestantism and industrialization as each had developed in Europe and North America. With charts and graphs, he traced technological advancement through modern history, beginning in Western Europe, where and when Protestant Christianity had flourished. To this point, he stressed that France had only a marginal role in the Industrial Revolution due to their relatively high rates of Catholicism. French society was full of vice because they did not follow the right gospel, he said. At this point, he addressed me directly, switching to English. Are you French? He asked me kindly, hoping for a negative answer. Um, a few people who spoke English laughed, and I said, I'm American, to which he said, ah, American. Okay, with a thumbs up. After the secularization of Western Europe in the 19th century, he continued, the United States became the locus of technological development as the promise and prominence of Christianity in Europe waned. Um, given, given our forum here, I want to just make an aside and mention that his historical account actually cited a couple of UC Berkeley uh, history professors, Carla Hesse and um, uh, Thomas LaCour, though I'm not sure if they would agree with his interpretation. Um, and similarly, I'm gonna set aside critical analysis of his reading of Weber as well. So in recent history, Professor Ko noted, South Korea had taken a prominent role in technological advancement through the work of companies like Samsung, LG, and Hyundai. In his view, this was the direct result of the rapid Christianization of the Korean people and God's blessing upon them. The point that he most stressed was that the future well being of Korea was dependent upon its mutual advancement of both Protestant Christianity and technological innovation. Now that Protestantism had enabled Korea to become a technological power, Christians needed to align their efforts with new technologies so that they could continue to spread the gospel and not suffer the same fate as modern secular Europe. Material and spiritual prosperity were not the same, but they had a unique codependence in this narrative. Uh, put simply, the nation is technological insofar as it remained Christian. Since 2014, I have spent nearly three years with IT missionaries and technology teams in multi-site churches in Seoul and in Koreatown, Los Angeles, to learn how people understand the technologies that are central to these dispersed congregations. The students in the IT mission school were neither technolog technology professionals nor professional missionaries. Many of them were teachers, housewives, and office workers who had little or no computer science training. One woman referred to herself as a quote unquote computer illiterate person or kumbang to me. But despite her lack of confidence in the effectiveness of her computer use, she continued to work as an IT missionary. When in doubt, they told me, they drew on and cultivated faith. So when I asked one middle-aged attendee if he had heard or believed Professor Ko's particular historical narrative, his response was sure. I mean, whether or not there's that kind of story about technology and Christianity, I don't really know, but that's fine. Not knowing is not a problem. Even though I don't know, I'm trying to do God's work. You have to have faith. He paused and read confusion on my face. Is it strange that I say, I don't know like this? He laughed. It looks like maybe you don't hear many Korean people say this. He laughed again. In Korean society, it's rather strange to admit your weaknesses but is it a problem that I don't know much about technology? Many tech experts can be wrong and sometimes problems actually arise because they, keep, they think they know everything. But I'm a Christian. When we use the tools that God gave us, we must put faith in God. We broke up into small groups, 
focusing on particular IT mission ministry projects. A woman named Sami decided she would use her Instagram and Pinterest accounts to transform social media into a mission field. Sami lived with her husband on the periphery of Seoul. She had worked as a teacher in her early, early 20s, but the familial responsibilities she felt as a new wife and daughter-in-law led her to quit her job. With her husband at work for most of the day and night, she spent more time than she might wish on social media as a way of passing time. The idea of becoming an IT missionary then seemed appealing to her because of its promise for social and spiritual connection, despite geographic isolation in her apartment. She prayed every day over Instagram, asking God to lead her to direct certain messages to strangers, particularly ethnic Koreans and Korean speakers abroad, who might respond to this kind of ministry. She didn't understand the algorithms within these platforms, and so she often doubted that her messages would be read at all let alone by a receptive audience. Sometimes these limitations created a certain sort of ambivalence. She said, as they say, the spirit can move through technology and I really do feel touched sometimes, but it might be silly, I don't know. Sometimes when I'm sitting alone at home, just posting things and commenting on strangers posts, I think I'm a real fool, huh? She chuckled. I mean, it's weird, right? You can spend hours on Instagram and then realize all that time is gone. And what have I really done? Nevertheless, she prayed that God might direct her actions in Seoul on the social media platforms and the activities of geographically distant strangers to align message and, and uh, receiver. She says, at those times, I don't know whether or not I'm doing anything at all, but I must have faith that God is doing things for us that I don't know about. If I pray or follow him, I have faith that the Lord will lead the perfect message to the right person. Faith was a necessary resource upon which Sami drew, but it was also a virtue that was cultivated through this practice. When Sami offers, uh, refers to faith in God here, um, we should not understand this as a sort of Kierkegaardian belief in the incomprehensible, but more as a capacity to place limits on one's own agency in deference to a higher power what the anthropologist Hirokazu Miyazaki described as an abeyance of agency. By working toward her goal to grow the transnational church, despite her recognition that she had no control over how an algorithm might direct her digital actions, Sami realized her faith by submitting her efforts to the mysterious operation of the Holy Spirit, which she believes operates within and exceeds the social media platforms. So um, to sum up here, I just wanna mention that for many Christians engaging in these IT ministries, it's clear that their understanding of information technologies were inextricable from their theologies of the Holy Spirit, um, their understanding of virtue ethics and their view of Christian history. Just like the hidden secret workings of the Holy Spirit, the operation of media algorithms was also opaque. But however, contrary to contemporary debates about algorithmic ethics, that focus on pursuing systems that are more just and more transparent, the hidden but determinative sorting functions of algorithms were not seen as a problem to be solved, but just a situation to be negotiated. Rather than seeking total mastery, they see technology use as a way of developing their faith by subordinating themselves to things beyond their control and working towards uncertain ends. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, that was so fascinating. Um, now we turn to um, Dr. Stephen Anthony Berry. Can you please uh, turn your screen on? Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn, and, and thanks to The Matrix for, for having us. Uh, this is wonderful. Um, my talk today I'm calling Spirituality and Psychotherapy in Technological Spaces. Um, so in this talk, I'll be exploring what happens to contemporary forms of spirituality and to forms of psychotherapy as these move into and inhabit technological spaces. I'm thinking about a broad range of spaces, uh, social media, forms of app-based group communication, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, gaming platforms like Twitch, um, and also new psychotherapy apps and platforms that have really taken flight during COVID, such as Talkspace and Lyra Health. Importantly, what does their moving into technological spaces do to the spiritualities and the psychotherapies, social and civic possibilities and vulnerabilities. 
So why spirituality and psychotherapy? This is partly because these are spheres in which I move professionally. Um, I do sociological research on the spiritual but not religious, and I'm also a, a, a psychoanalyst. But also these two spheres, spirituality and psychotherapy, have often been drawn together by sociologists of religion, usually in terms of emphasizing their social and civic lack. So it's fitting here uh, at, at Berkeley to turn to the late uh, Berkeley sociologist of religion, Robert Bella, um, and, and specifically to his 1985 book with co-authors, Habits of the Heart. Um, Bella and his co-authors saw, I'm quoting them here, um, in the upwelling of mystical feeling in the 1960s and forward, the particular distortions to which the mystical type is prone, its extreme weakness in social and political organization, and above all, its particular form of compromise with the world, namely its closeness to the therapeutic model in its pursuit of self-centered experiences and its difficulty with social loyalty and commitment. Bella saw the spread of these spiritualities and of therapeutic culture as the spread of a radical individualism, what he called ontological individualism, divorced from social priority and constraints. This argument echoes through scholarly and uh, popular narratives that link the ascent of religiously non-affiliated spirituality, the so-called religious nuns, that's N-O-N-E-S, and the spiritual but not religious with social decline, the so-called low social engagement hypothesis. To this view, the pervasive social and civic decline indicated, for instance, in Robert Putnam's research becomes what Bella called a massive empirical confirmation of his argument in habits. To this view, the spiritual but not religious and the widespread psychothera psychotherapeutic pursuit of deeper self-understanding, inner authenticity, and emotional expansiveness deliver us to loneliness, solipsism, narcissism, and the decline of the public square. Now, it probably won't surprise you that I don't agree that this is inevitable, but I do think that Bella identifies something important, uh, but it's only part of the picture. In my own ethnographic research with a network of young adult nuns, my observation has been that social relationships often run deep among the nuns, contributing to forming their experience of the sacred. And with psychotherapy, patients' pursuit of inner meaning and authenticity often happen in the context of their deepening experience and embeddedness in human relationships. Certain clinical approaches are particularly attuned to this, for instance, contemporary psychoanalytic approaches that pay close attention to webs of relationships, complexity, and intersubjective systems. What Bella and others point to as an intrinsic lack, I see as a vulnerability within spiritualities and often also within psychotherapies. There can be a vulnerability to bypass social connection and civic responsibility. But on the other side of the equation with these spiritualities and psychotherapies, there is sociological strength and glue, and also subtly emerging configurations of inner life, social solidarity, and civic action, configurations that often go unseen or misunderstood by sociologists. The question for this current talk then is, what happens when these spiritualities and psychotherapies enter into technological spaces? What happens in terms of the individualistic vulnerability? And what happens in terms of the emerging social and civic configurations? In order to think this through, how shall we conceptualize the social dimensions of the nuns' spiritualities? From a sociological vantage point, it's easiest to see what the nuns reject. They move away, they move away from familiar patterns of religious institution, organization, clear-cut definition, and practice. But in beginning to see the nuns in their sociological presence, it's important to connect inner experience with external social forms. For many nuns, the inner and the outer are inextricably bound. Looking just at the traditional social forms constitutes a very partial view. I'm going to draw here on an in-press article in which I theorize this dynamic psychoanalytically. I argue that many nuns' spiritualities may be seen as the sacralization of intersubjective experience, of what the psychoanalyst Darlene Ehrenberg calls the intimate edge. The external social forms that come into being among the nuns tend to be loosely knit spiritual networks. Some are explicitly spiritual, such as among people interested in a particular vein of Indian mysticism. 
Others are less articulated as spiritual, but adopt practices that evoke a sense of spiritual experience, such as yoga. These networks tend to emerge for a period, begin to take shape, and then as they start to have the flavor of institutionalization, concreteness, organization of religion, their participants tend to pull back into them and the external forms of the networks ebb. Importantly, however, the nuns involved, even as their external networks ebb, often continue to experience the networks internally. The feelings of interconnection, past and present, deeply alive, internalized relationships that constitute or contribute to the nuns' continuing experience of the sacred. Then the external forms of the networks reemerge, expand, and recede. Darlene Ehrenberg's theory of the intimate edge is useful for understanding this choreography. She is writing about clinical psychoanalysis, but her concept is equally useful in terms of theorizing social relationships among the spiritual but not religious. Ehrenberg defines the intimate edge as the point of maximum contact and intimacy with another person without losing one's individual identity. Maximum intimacy without merger. The intimate edge involves the pursuit of a horizontal rather than a vertical structure of social authority and relationship. For their part, the nuns pursue horizontal relationships with other nuns, and in this way they challenge traditional, ecclesi uh, um, traditional religious structures of ecclesiastical authority, vertical hierarchy, and institutional control. So here, here are a few important elements of the intimate edge drawing on Ehrenberg. First, the intimate edge is not a static achievement, but rather it's, it's a process. Second, intimate edge experience is temporary, ephemeral, and continually changing. Third, a deep longing often accompanies and animates the pursuit of intimate edge experience. Longing for a realm of experience that cannot be mapped or known before it is co-created and experienced together. And yet this longing nonetheless resounds deeply within and inspires the shared venture into the unknown. And finally, intimate edge experience, while temporary and ephemeral, generates something new that did not exist before. What I'm arguing here is that for many nuns, what is generated, what persists within, retains the imprint of its fundamentally intersubjective creation. So the nun spiritual networks emerge and recede, they ebb and flow. There is an ephemeral quality to them, which has led to their being interpreted as shallow and insufficient in comparison to the institutional, persisting, clear-cut religious structures they replace. But these dynamics take on new meaning in terms, uh, new meaning and substance in terms of the logic of the sacralization of the intimate edge. Nuns who fit this pattern are not simply individualistic, nor are their social networks merely weak and faulty versions of traditional religious institutions. Rather, there's an entirely different logic and paradigm at work. These networks, these nuns and their networks move toward the intimate edge and away from the inevitable upcroppings of traditional religion uh, and religious institution. When these religious features emerge, the intimate edge dulls and the networks recede but the internalized relationships derived from intimate edge experience continue to effervesce internally, animating and shaping an inner experience of the divine, an inner experience which is not really solitary. Deep longing for authentic contact exerts its melancholic force. The scene is set for other emergences, comings together at the intimate edge that do not live long in the air and sunlight of the world, but also do not really die. And so, what happens when these dynamics unfold online in apps and other technological spaces? Do these spaces exploit the nuns' individualistic vulnerability or do they support their social creativity? To explore this, it's important, it's important to consider the technological spaces and the companies and technologists who produce them in religious terms. This isn't a stretch, there's a number of projects being done right now that, that speak to this. Um, I'm especially excited about Carolyn Chen's upcoming book, Work, Pray, Code, which I understand explores ways in which technology companies work, uh, use work to meet the needs that religion once met. And also the technology spaces themselves also evoke deep questions for users, essentially spiritual questions as I see them about what it means to be human and to be connected with others. 
So it's not a leap to consider these companies and their products in religious terms. Like Heather, actually, and I'm, I'm turning to Max Weber here. Um, Weber described the arc of modern life as one of increasing rationalization and disenchantment. To this view, modern life is increasingly impersonal, systematized, and institutional. For Weber, charismatic prophets can undermine the drumbeat of rationalization and di disenchantment, but this is always temporary. Uh, each spiritual movement, if it is to persist, must then accommodate to the wider culture. It must transform charismatic authority into forms of authority more in line with rationalization. To borrow popular parlance, in this process, the spiritual becomes the religious. Weber referred to this process as the routinization of charisma. In Silicon Valley company culture, marketing, and inbuilt into many of the tech social spaces that they produce, there is charismatic religious prophecy, the promise of deeper, more instantaneous, ubiquitous, intimate, more authentic connections with ourselves and with others. But there is also in these cultures and in the products they produce, radical routinization. The shiny new phone, social network, virtual, virtual gaming community and onward promise direct and experiential connection of an almost metaphysical sort. At the same time, activities on these platforms serve as distinctly routinizing processes. The user's pursuit of authentic connections service the company's powerful, impersonal, systematized, institutional, and economic engines. So what does this mean for contemporary spiritualities and psychotherapies? It means, I think, that entrance into these online spaces involves inhabiting a paradox that goes to the core of their social and civic vulnerabilities and possibilities. One way of looking at this lines up with Bella's critique, the idea that contemporary spiritual yearnings and experiences, while espousing authenticity and connection, now through technology, support systems of selfish pursuit and instrumentality. On the therapeutic front, a similar conclusion is possible. The idea that technological platforms lend themselves to short-term manualized therapies to clinical work that unfolds as a closed horizon, where a symptom leads to an algorithmically determined therapeutic solution, A to B, the technological apotheosis of managed care, rather than a clinical open horizon that tolerates silence and time, that allows the patient and therapist to sink into and explore less determinable, less instrumentally motivated, less defined and definable depths of inner life and mutual experience. Another way of looking at this, however, is that the technological paradox, prophecy and routinization in a click, goes to the core of contemporary spiritual yearnings. It is this very paradox that animates the sociological pattern of building and dismantling spiritual networks while connections remain inwardly alive, the ebb and the flow of contemporary spiritual life. We, we could look at the technological predicament as a koan, as contradiction and disappointment that motivates for the spiritual seeker, the familiar ebb and flow dance of sociological creativity, moving in and out of technological spaces as the spaces themselves, as the spaces themselves evolve and devolve. And for those in therapy, tech spaces may present the opportunity to explore social yearning and disappointment, and also the pathways that feeling this sadness and yearning opens up. A paradox, a cage, a closed horizon, yes. But what is this like and where does this take us? The paths that this opens up may be less defined, less algorithmic. We can explore all of this together. So those are some thoughts about spirituality and psychotherapy in technological spaces. I think there's still a lot to consider. It's all very much in process. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen, for those reflections on, um, on, on spiritual experience among nuns and psychotherapy. Um, next, we turn to Dr. Erica Galt, who is going to be sharing some of her work on digital Black Christians. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to The Matrix for the um, invitation to be in dialogue on religion and, and in the information age. Um, I want to begin with the disclaimer that this is a story told best through memes. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen uh, 
if you can't see that, please let me know. Um, so I, I want to begin with, with a story, um, with a story here. Um, I wanna tell you about a wooden framed church uh, from when I was growing up. It set far back on what seemed like a grassy hill, but thinking back, it was more just a mound <laughs> um, at the end of a dirt road, which was likely paved first by first peoples, horses, slaves, then former slaves, and finally in the late 80s by the old Lincoln sedan that my father drove us uh, to church in each Sunday morning. I would like to give you some sense of the rhythmic feel of the snare drum, the cowbells, and the tambourine that were matched only by our own foot stomping on the wooden floorboards as the steel guitarist, his hands and knuckles swollen and scarred from picking cotton most of his life. But now gracefully, they moved along those same fingers along his lap guitar, adding melody and meaning to our songs. When I think of the sound, the spirit, and the songs that took me in, as we say in the Black church, or that got me over, um, as I would arguably say Mahalia Jackson best sung first, um, how I got over. Um, I think of those memories first and foremost. Those are also the memories of the Black church that ultimately led me online. And when I think of that, um, I, often, I often think are these two Black churches, how do we reconcile the two? Um, and more importantly, how do we name, define, and identify the digital Black church? Because usually we only talk about the Black church um, as this kind of timeless and unchanging entity. But I wanna put forward a conversation about naming the digital Black church um, as something separate for investigative purposes. And so I'm thinking about the digital contours of the Black church today. Let me know if this image is apparent on here and I'll know um, whether the rest of the PowerPoint is viewable to everyone, if that's, if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. The image that you're seeing here um, is kind of my metaphor for thinking through this and how we often think about the black church um, as this kind of uh, contained and transparent uh, flat kind of group, um, the physical black church when in fact, perhaps a more apt description is a visualization, something like this, as not only free welding, um, while these shapes of light might be in constellation with each other, they remain fluid and in many ways apart and always shifting in terms of their meaning. And so when I think of what forms the digital Black church, that leads to uh, three points of investigation. One, I would argue that it is a manifestation of the earlier, of earlier Black technologies. It's a site for critical engagement with and apart from the physical Black church. And last, it is a hyper performance of the Black church, uh, what E. Patrick Johnson calls religious performativity and Suet Kabir calls racial religious performativity. And I add to that digital racial religious performativity, which my research assistant rightly criticized as too much of a mouthful um, to have as a term uh, in your research. And so more simplistically put, uh, web work, but that kind of deep performance um, that continues and has become enlarged in the digital space. So when we think about that very first one, the manifestation of earlier technologies, uh, one of the first voices that comes to mind for me, and arguably you could raise several other uh, Black religious voices in history, but I go to Nat Turner and thinking about what I term spiritual technologies. 
the signs, miracles, and other forms of divine communication that Black folks traditionally use in building new religious networks for Black liberation among diverse Black and gendered bodies operating at the margins of Christian accessibility, acceptability. In part because Nat Turner's legacy has received such diverse reads, the centrality of technology to his story remains under underexplored. Technology, the intellectual production of systems or systematic approaches um, are often rendered as more legitimate or authoritative than technique, which is still this form of technology, but is more closely associated quite often with the doing of technology. Techniques, however, are, as you may know, usually the less coveted form of production because in this instance of its connection to Black practices, the doing of technology as a Black practice. Turner is often caught, cast as either a religious zealot or um, in the words of William Styrone in his hotly contested fictionalized account of Nat Turner's life as a fanatical Black man. However, in Thomas Gray's Confessions of Nat Turner, it is with methodic force that Turner relates the honing of spiritual technologies that produce miracle signs and divine communication. The revelation of complex systems of knowledge empowered Turner with skills that rivaled white slave masters' own technological weaponry and expanded Turner's network of fellow enslaved Blacks. And while he has been written down uh, in history, even the uh, best kinds of depictions of Nat Turner do not talk about him um, as a scientific mind. Um, and it might seem uh, even this scholar is kind of uh, um, exaggerating or this is a reach, um, but you have to think of, of the um, confessions of Nat Turner as revealing these early kind of pyrotechnic skills as he talks about the chemicals that are necessary um, for explosive devices and how he also talks about the way in which his divine communication through prophecy enables him this kind of knowledge. Um, yet what Gray in uh, the Confessions of Nat Turner could not foresee is that the black church tradition has continued to encompass such quote unquote unfit Christians um, as Turner. They are not always violent, but like Turner, they upset white and black church hierarchies and sensibilities that seek to totalize Christian identity and terrorize perceived outliers. Through the use of technology, such unfit Christians continue to problematize the faith and the notion of the black church in important ways. And that's what we see when we look at digital manifestations of the black church. So here's, as I said, a meme uh, to consider. Um, I am, I should tell you a, a black church meme affectionado. Um, I love these uh, because they reveal so much about the digital black church. Um, but I have here spiritual technologies continue black mothers as OGs, um, both in its usual usage, but also the original Google um, that black mothers can find you anywhere. Um, is a common adage uh, used in several different ways within Black communities. But here's an image of Kobe Bryant, and it says, how your mom looks when the pastor says something about disobedient children. And of course, this is supposed to put us in a Black church and uh, really this performance of Black motherhood. However, as means do, it detaches it from its original context, thus making it funny, okay? Kobe Bryant is not your Black mother, nor is he in a Black church. And yet it tells us something about the Black church within the digital context. And But this is meant to be a kind of revival of Black church activities and this kind of performance. Um, of the same. I would um, also add to that, that when you talk about earlier spiritual technologies in the place of these kinds of 
all seeing eyes or all seeing knowledge that God empowers one with, the black mother enters this kind of narrative representative of these other knowing kind of skills in this sense, the ability of omnipresence or the ability to see your child. And there's several versions of this kind of story. But in all of these memes, the black mother shows up either very well um, or very powerful. Um, having these otherworldly kind of abilities. And so even though it's taken out of its context, it's ripped out of the context of the Black church, it continues to imbue that same kind of power um, of the earlier forms of the Black church and the use of spiritual technologies. Another instance of that points to my second point, uh, the Black church, digital Black church as a site for critical engagement with and apart from the physical Black church. And I denote these kinds of differences because when we talk about the Black church, it has become this kind of catch-all for all Black religion, all ages, um, all members who may be very diverse, uh, but all Black folks being a part of the Black church. And so my forthcoming book, Networking the Black Church, looks specifically at that group called Black Millennials, or who I call Digital Black Christians, because their expression of the Black church takes place in different ways uh, and is interpreted differently within a digital context. And so I looked over a period of two years uh, um, at the lives of a number of Black Millennials, and one of those was a rapper by the name of Propaganda. And he described himself as an older OS or operating system version of a millennial, not quite a millennial, but, but an OS version. If you've seen recent news reports, uh, these millennials are now called geriatric millennials, which is an interesting term in itself as an aside. Um, but it is telling us of this group that operates differently within the Black church. Like another rapper, popular rapper, Lecrae, these older digital Black Christians see themselves as straddling technological time periods and have used this to, to remediatize, mediatize forms of Black culture. Older digital Black Christians through their innovative use of digital tools were imposing new visions on the world through their music. And discussing what a millennial is, they are saying something regarding their ability to see the necessity of translating through embodied practices like beat making one technological process that is analog into another technological process into digital. As the attuned reader might suspect then, I am here referring to Michael Foucault's notion of the technology of self. While he defines four major types of technology, production, sign systems, power, and self, he contends that these often function in relation to one another, one another technologies of self flow, allow the individual alone or in conjunction with other, others to affect their environs by transforming their own bodies, souls, thought, or way of being in order to achieve happiness or wholeness. Like any technological innovation, then digital technology follows a pattern. And we must think of critically, I think, uh, there needs to be a critical reflection on what the digital itself means uh, for the manifestation of the Black church. It makes use of older innovations and in forming a more rapid, layered process for task completion. Meredith Brochard demonstrates this process by cataloging the complex network of codes required to create a simple thing like a space between texts. But what underlies that exactly when we hit the space bar? Beneath that single command, a structured process of information retrieval occurs. Digital Black Christians who appeared in a technology chain at the point of analog were able to go behind the curtain of the Black church, so to speak, in order to digitize its practices, acting as this kind of bridge between the physically located Black church and the digital Black church. We see that manifest in a number of ways. 
But even when we talk about the steady meditation in the digital black church on something like the death narrative, we're seeing the manifestation of that earlier black church. Um, I would argue that hashtags uh, that began to appear following the death of Trayvon Martin, like hashtag RIP baby boy, other hashtags like say her name or black lives matter is this kind of meditation that is sacred for those who participate in the digital black church. In these hashtags, we are looking at the revival of, and some would even argue, um, the new spirituals, hashtags as the new spirituals, um, for they do the same kind of work of informing us and transforming us on the notion of Black death, both its surety and the possibility of overcoming it uh, for uh, those participants in the Black church. And then there are these other images that tell us within the digital scape, the way earlier forms of technology that one would have seen through TV series uh, like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, earlier films like Lion King, or even this conversation um, in the Cosby show where uh, Dr. Huxtable is telling his son, I bought you in this world and I will take you out. Um, in those that I interviewed and studied over a two year period, these were images and stories that they constantly returned to both in their artistic work and in their discussion of father and things like death. Figures like Tupac also factor in this and the death of Tupac figuring large. Um, how they then take those images and remediatize them tells us a lot about their reflections on death um, and how the black church continues to take that up. Um, but something to keep in mind and kind of pointing to my last point and I, I think is perhaps a good place um, to begin to close also, um, is that these images are a hyper performance of the Black church. Because the digital moves so quickly, one does not get the story that is connected to the past or the rich tradition of the Black church. Um, it is also subject um, to hyper capitalist, heteropatriarchal, white supremacist um, indications of what Blackness and Black culture are. This kind of image here of good times that tells the story of the death of her husband, quite tragically so, um, is the first instance of a Black de death that is filmed on television and that is recorded in this kind of sustained way. It becomes, however, when it is detached from its original content in the second image, this very funny comedic kind of take on death, either in this case, rather in this case, is the death of a parent in the um, hit TV show, mid nineties on Martin. How does this happen? Um, in much the same way that I talked earlier about memes, it becomes detached um, in this way that allows for it to take on a different emotion and a different meaning. Uh, the meaning that becomes so important as we're seeing with Facebook's most recent problems is that we go for the highly charged emotional kind of content that gives us the algorithmic success of certain companies uh, that we see at present. Um, both in thinking about next steps and what might be the answer for the further study of the digital black church then, I would say a few things. One, when I talk about the Black church that I come from, um, the kind of autoethnography that I engage in is a continuous testifying. Um, as well, it is a attempt to arrest the algorithms, if you will, and telling stories that are diverse, that are multiplicitous about the engagement of Black folks with the Black church and lodges a critique on the way that the Black church has been misconstrued historically and presently um, as this single kind of fishbowl. Um, however, it is complex and fluid. Um, I think in further study, um, one of the uh, best directions is the critical study of race. And there have been some wonderful works uh, coming out now around critical race theory, uh, critical digital black studies, um, and for the study of contemporary religion and religious practices. I think those are some some of the uh, most important and lively sites for such a conversation on religion in the age of information. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, for that really fascinating discussion on the Black, on the digital Black church. Um, now we turn to Dr. Kelsey Burke. 
um, who will be sharing her research on sexuality and religion and the internet. Kelsey? Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be with you today. Um, thanks, Carolyn, and to the other panelists. Um, you are all hard acts to follow, and I've um, enjoyed so much learning about these diverse topics. So my specific expertise when it comes to religion in the age of information comes from my research on Christian sex advice and how it as a genre and an industry has been transformed by the internet. Uh, this might seem like a niche topic, but I hope that my brief remarks today can help us better understand the relationship between digital media and theologically conservative religious traditions broadly, and specifically the relationship between conservative white evangelicals and American culture. So I'd like to introduce you to my research by telling you the story of one of my interview participants, Samantha, who ran a website, which was an online store and a blog that she called Samantha's, uh, that specialized in sex toys for women. So for unsuspecting visitors to the site, Samantha's funny and confident writing style may have conjured up images of Sex and the City's Samantha, the TV character who loved to talk about sex almost as much as she loved to have it. But disrupting this Hollywood image is the story of how her website began when Samantha asked for prayers from an online community of fellow conservative Christians about whether or not God wanted her to start her adult store business. And God's answer, the website users unanimously agreed, was yes. So I followed Samantha online for about a year before I interviewed her. This was part of my dissertation research at the time that eventually became my first book where I studied dozens of Christian sexuality websites. I collected all of this data about a decade ago and so technologies have changed quite a bit since then, but I think the lessons that I have learned uh, continue to live on. So I was among thousands of others who encountered Samantha's virtual presence. No one online, including me, knew what Samantha really looked like, who she quote unquote really was. Samantha was not her real name. It was a username that she created for her online activity. But Samantha's story, I would come to learn, was a common one for evangelical women I encountered who used Christian sex advice websites. So just a few years before she started her business, Samantha had never used a sex toy herself or had even experienced an orgasm. She grew up in an evangelical church that spoke very little about sexuality. And for years after she got married, she told me that she enjoyed the closeness she felt to her husband during sex, but she never really felt deep pleasure or desire. And when she finally shared some of these troubles with a close friend of hers, the friend told Samantha about a website that Samantha described to me as, quote, where people talk about sex in a really frank but respectful way and from a Christian worldview. So Samantha followed her friend's advice. She got on her computer and she typed the URL for a website that I call betweenthesheets.com. And it was there that she discovered a virtual world of over 30,000 registered members who were engaged and married Christians who talked in frank and really explicit ways about sexuality through a series of message board threads. So she would later describe in an interview to me, quote, I was just so floored, I mean, in a happy way, that people were talking about really specific things like try this technique or lean forward or lean backwards, like really practical stuff. I could tell that people had a heart for God and for their spouse and for wanting to help people. So I started posting and getting a lot of encouragement. I just needed to learn so many things. So Samantha found this online community of people who just like her had what she describes a heart for God, but they were not focusing on the sins of sexuality like Samantha was used to in her evangelical church growing up. Instead, they were insisting that God wants married heterosexual couples to have active and satisfying sex lives. So thanking God for great sex was not a flippant vulgarity, but was for these website users, a sincere form of praise. 
American evangelicals have a very rich history when it comes to promoting sexual pleasure within marriage. They've drawn upon multiple mediums, books, workshops, radio shows, all since the 1970s. And today, evangelicals encourage sexual expression in all of these ways, as well as a wide range of digital media, which became the focus of my study. So this includes online stores like Samantha's that sell intimacy products, online message boards, blogs, podcasts, and virtual Bible studies, all that discuss a wide range of topics related to marital sex. And these digital media reflect the ideas that are presented in print literature that are often written by well-established and respected evangelical authorities. But I came to learn that they also do much more. So unlike a book that is already written, the internet is kind of like a book that is constantly being rewritten by a collective of lay people, each with their own unique experiences and perspectives. And these spaces also allow for non-evangelical religious collaborators who buy into the parameters set forth by a conservative evangelicalism, namely that sex is intended only within heterosexual monogamous matrimony. So over the years that I spent researching Christian sex advice websites, I found that creators and users were able to draw from existing religious doctrine while also talking about God in really personal and sometimes unorthodox and surprising ways. So ethnographers of religious communities have long offered many examples of how in particular evangelical believers understand a God that is intensely involved in their everyday lives, not removed from it. So God meddles in the mundane, what Robert Orsi calls everyday miracles, wherein all of life's events from joyful ones like overcoming an illness to unhappy endings like losing financial savings can all be opportunities to connect a divine force to ordinary life, kind of like the Holy Spirit influencing IT algorithms. So contemporary Christian beliefs generate both the sense that God is real and he has powers that are distinctly non-human. Um, so I really like in her ethnography of a non-denominational Vineyard Church, anthropologist T.M. Lurman observes that evangelical beliefs are, as she writes, in effect, a third kind of epistemological commitment, not materially real like tables and chairs, but not fictional like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So religion offers believers a method to grasp their realities and make sense of life circumstances. But at the same time, it leaves room for awe and for wonder for things that are not completely understood. And religion as this in-between real tangible and supernatural divine mirrors the ways in which scholars have often described the cultural effects of digital media and cyberspace, what Michael Ross has described as a, faith, a space between fantasy and action. So the internet shares this resemblance to Lerman's description of the God evangelicals believe in, that it lacks a physical presence that still feels almost ubiquitous in our lives. It's not reducible to our computers or our smart, smartphones, but it's awfully deeply tied to these tangible components. So virtual reality is not quite material, but nor is it imaginary. It's out there somewhere, difficult to definitively describe, impossible to capture in scope. And I think it's these parallels that are what make religion online so enthralling to its users. One way that I think about Christian sexuality websites and more broadly religion in the age of information is to think about what urban designers call desire paths or desire lines. So we've likely all seen them in city parks or on college campuses where there are trails that are determined by where people walk rather than um, paved sidewalks or pre-marked paths. So if we think of prescriptive religion or formalized religious institutions as like the carefully planned and professionally designed routes, the internet creates these desire lines that may at times travel alongside established religious traditions, but at other times they can cut corners, they can extend further or even go in an entirely different direction. So what I found is that with some deft discursive maneuvering, website users are able to challenge many of the stereotypes we have about conservative Christians, namely that they're anti-sex. So I observed how website users are able to make men who are interested in kinky sex seem 
more, not less, connected to God, how they portray women's masturbation as an act of submission to God and their husbands rather than an act of independence, and they make Christian marriages seem steamy and sexy while at the same time wholesome and respectable. So I observed this dance between the openings that website users create for sexual expression within Christian marriages and also the closures that they reinforce by perpetuating the regulatory systems of gender, heterosexuality, and Protestant Christianity. So collectively, online conversations can help evangelicals do what they seem to do best, which is to use culturally salient spaces to embed contemporary dialogue with religious meaning. So this sort of keeps them as a religious group in this in-between space not entirely separate from, but also not fully participating in broader culture. So Christian sexuality website users can remain attached to religious beliefs that hold them as exclusive bearers of godly values, while also participating in some of the pleasures of modern and a seemingly secular life. I think of Christian sexuality websites as more trajectories than fixed places. And I think this is true of religion in the age of information more broadly. So in one moment, we may see them perfectly parallel religious dogma, but in another, we might find differences that may be obvious or subtle from pre-existing religious beliefs. So websites go where ordinary believers take them, where their desires and pleasures propel them, but their sense of choice is not unlimited. So it's bounded by a sense of where they can go. So things like heterosexuality, monogamy, and the gender binary are kind of like these massive oak trees that website users don't attempt to cut down or climb over. But still, I think we can look to these sites and their users to show how really fragile um, the Christian landscape may be. So like desire paths that may irre 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 irrevocably alter the natural ecosystem, Christian sexuality websites too can transform what religion and sexuality might be in the 21st century. Um, I'll end there and look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Kelsey. That was really fascinating, um, this, the discussion that you had in so many ways, I think, connected to um, so many of the other um, comments um, and presentations prior. If, if you don't all mind, if you could just show your faces so that we can engage in a discussion for the remaining um, moments of the panel. And just also a reminder to our audience that if you have questions to please post them in the Q&A um, in the Q&A place. Um, so I want to just start with a question that I found this, you know, I, I found this tension really um, um, or just an interesting tension among all of your presentations. And that was um, between this sense that um, the internet and technology um, was a place for religious innovation. And this really came through, especially Kelsey, as you talked about desire lines and how that contrasts with this sort of brick and mortar institutional church, right? That people can sort of follow these desire lines and that you don't know where it's going. And I think that also came through very strongly, Stephen, in your presentation also, just about the, um, I forget this exactly the image that you use, but sort of the opening and closing of new uh, collectivity, spiritual collectivities and how the internet and technology could, could aid in doing that. Um, so that's on this one side that I think a theme that you all talked about um, in each of your presentations is that, the, the possibility of technology for producing religious innovation. But on the other hand, there's this also the tension of algorithms, right? And I think that this is something that came through in, um, in, in, in Erica and Heather's talk is about this algorithms which are predictive and also are conforming. I mean, what's interesting in many of your presentations is that you're all talking about um, in a way, minority religious groups, right? Groups that are not finding a place in mainstream religion in, in certain, certain ways. 
Um, you know, and that's, you know, especially Stephen in your presentation of these folks who don't, don't necessarily, they're religious knots, right? That they're, they're, their identity is based on their absence of religion. And then for Kelsey, you're talking about these evangelicals who, you know, don't, they can't necessarily speak about these things in, in, in the church, right? Um, and then, then also with, with you, um, Erica, you're talking about these digital black millennial Christians that might not have found a place in the black church otherwise. So, okay, so anyways, let me just back up. My question really is about that tension between technology providing, um, being a mechanism or an impetus for religious innovation versus also the tension with algorithms as creating conformity and perhaps um, uh, um, well, conformity, like, let me just put it, leave it at that. So let me just open it to, to all of you and just jump in. I'll, I'll jump in, Carolyn. Uh, I mean, I think that's, that's a really interesting observation. And I, I too saw it kind of that thread running throughout everyone's presentations in different ways. Um, I think for the folks that I study, the, the nuns, um, that kind of tension that you're describing between a kind of algorithmic foreclosure or closed horizon and, and this sort of open horizon, enthusiastic uh, experiential opening that the technology provides for a kind of connection in a, you know, a deep fashion, that paradox very much sort of mirrors the, you know, the, the, what, what I think sort of produces their religious creativity to begin with. You know, this sort of opening into collective spiritual experience that then con gets concretized inevitably becomes more religious and then they pull back from it. And it's sort of, it's this ebb and flow, this, this wave pattern moving in and out. And, and so, I, I mean, I see technology, uh, spiritual, you know, moving into technology, technological spaces for these people um, um, is, is very much a sort of, um, reflective of that architecture. And, and, and so it's both, you know, a sort of familiar disappointment when, um, when, you know, when they move into algorithmic foreclosure, um, but then also motivates that same process, you know, so moving out of certain technological spaces into others. And, you know, when those get concretized and feel too foreclosed, they move out and in, it's this same sort of process. So that's, that's what comes to mind for me. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I can also jump in. Oh, go ahead, Erica, you go first. Oh, okay. Um, what, what I was um, thinking of uh, enjoying so much of um, uh, the, the presentations, I, I, I was thinking of how for my group, um, it is often out of survival uh, that their creativity flows. Um, that their practices are in many ways at risk um, and without exaggeration under a tremendous amount of terrorism um, in the communities that they come out of. Um, and so it's this kind of duplicitous um, situation that they're in uh, and that's where the tension really arises because in other ways, and I'm thinking of um, Heather, your presentation and talking about these as multi-site uh, churches that began with South Asian communities, even though when we think of what is a mega church, that's usually not the site that we go through. The, these, these are first peoples. They, they are the first to arrive at these technologies out of necessity um, and having those um, always uh, in conflict and always subject to censure or being taken away by the broader community uh, keeps that tension there, but also the necessity of finding, creating, and maintaining these kinds of spaces. Yeah, and what I was just going to add is, you know, an observation that I think across the different topics that we study is what um, a sociologist Nancy Ammerman writes about as religious practice, like the stuff that we do that is never entirely original. It, it, it is always sort of coming from somewhere and bound in, in some structures, but that it's also by its very nature of being continually reproduced, which I think is so often apparent in digital media that that's where you know the, the room for creativity and agency 
um, can come from. And it's also interesting to think about algorithms as predictive and conforming, but that it's sometimes they're trying to in fact mask that intent, you know, to try to make it seem as if the, the website structure is limitless um, or is in, 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 in trying to endorse creativity or individualism, um, that that's just something that I think we see across different technological platforms that is also, you know, interesting to be a part of this conversation. That's absolutely right. I just to piggyback on on that point, which I think is really important, is that that the you know the creators and the owners of the algorithms, right? It serves their best interest to market these platforms or these particular spaces as new, innovative, creating a rupture, open, right, full of freedom. Um, and so it can be useful to to remember that certain words carry connotations that then can influence how we think about those, um, like analyzing religion in those spaces, right? The digital lends itself a little differently um, than, you know, thinking about the analog or something. Um, and so for this reason, I wonder if it might be helpful to kind of reframe this as just another, uh, as another iteration of, of a new media practice, right? Going back to your introductory remarks about the printing press, right? Different media have different affordances and, cap and capacities, um, right? But they're not without their limitations um, as well. And that's as true of the internet as it is from, you know, as it was with the printing press. And so maybe sometimes flipping into uh, a different kind of register thinking about media can be helpful here and thinking about this tension, which I think does run through um, all sorts of technological changes. Yeah, thank you. So fascinating. Um, we have a question here from our audience. Um, this is from Avi Rosen, Rosenzweig. Um, he writes, um, they write, Neil Postman, way back in Amusing Ourselves, made the useful distinction between entertainment values slash standards and other kinds of values and decried the re, um, reduction of politics and religion to entertainment. How does the modern church here in the USA and Korea answer the problem of turning congregations into audiences and pastors into MCs? Um, and I think this might be a question you know, that Erica might address too in her in her research as well. But um, I think this is for you, Heather. <laughs> okay, I'll start us off, but I think everybody has something really interesting to say about new modes of participation and community that are kind of co engendered through these use of new technologies. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting question um, that I, I don't necessarily want to generalize and say like all churches are like this or like that. Um, but in response, I will give a couple of um, notable examples. One is uh, one of my field sites was Yoidofu Gospel Church, which is the largest, often attributed to be the largest church in the world. Its main sanctuary itself claims about 800,000 congregants, and it has hundreds of campuses around the world. So um, it's, it's quite a place. Um, and in that church in particular, I have written about the way that um, you know, the use of media technologies and creating the multi-site church was sort of deliberately designed to create a centralized and hierarchical structure to the church. The founding pastor, Cho yong -gi, um, was very, very famous for his faith healing and his preaching. Um, and that was, a, that was a real draw for people. So when I did research in churches in Koreatown and Los Angeles, um, churches within that same uh, church system, Every Sunday, they had one service that was devoted to watching Cho yong um, service from Seoul, South Korea. And so, you know, there are, there are some ways in which that's actually not something that, that wants to be avoided. But, you know, in other cases, I have heard from many congregants of smaller satellite campuses that they actually feel a greater sense of ownership and participation within the church than they did at like a singular mega church, because at a mega church, there might be limited opportunities to serve on say the praise team or the, um, you know, the prayer ministry or the welcome team. Whereas if you have a, a, a lot of little congregations, suddenly there, there are, you know, endless possibilities for service and volunteering. And so 
Um, yeah, anyway, there are different ways that different churches deal with that. And it's not necessarily uh, always going to lend itself to one, one mode or another. Yeah, I definitely think uh, there's great diversity in how um, modern churches uh, approach that um, question. Uh, for many of the folks that that I studied in, in, in my ethnography, um, they rebrand, I would say, the Christian faith and the notion of the Black church so much so that when I use terms like Black church, digital Black church, those are terms for us within the scholarly community to kind of identify um, and investigate, um, but they might think of themselves as um, social media influencers or social media personalities or just a guy with who likes t-shirts um, and makes them Christian themed and out of that becomes a ministry. I'll tell um, a very quick story of uh, who we would call maybe a micro celebrity um, by the name of uh, Joseph Solomon, who I, I track in my uh, book. And Joseph Solomon is most interesting because he no longer identifies as a Christian. Um, he became known as basically a kind of um, unordained minister, huge following uh, in the millions on YouTube. Um, and it caused a tremendous amount of chaos in his small YouTube empire to say, I'm no longer Christian. And then he said, and I've never been a pastor. I never really called myself that, but he really didn't need to. Uh, they understood that they were his audience um, and they were his Patreon followers. And so you're seeing a lot of that of uh, rebranding the traditional operation of the Black church um, without even Um, that's that's really interesting. It's interesting too that you sort of the language that the market language that you use, the commercial language that you use of rebranding, um, because everything that's over the internet can is uh, feels, you know, very commercial. I would say. Um, I, here, here's one, one question: Is um, you know, how do we think about the plur plur proliferation of cults such as gr or groups such as like QAnon? Um, that, you know, the, the internet and technology has really made those groups possible, right? Um, and so in your view, um, does their relation to technology differ from the relationship of the groups that you've studied, um, which are, um, you know, except for Stephen, you know, uh, uh, recognizes legitimate religious groups. I'm wondering if anyone has any comments on that. Well, I can jump in with um, some thoughts because I study maybe the group that's closest to uh, groups like QAnon, conservative white evangelicals, who I think, um, you know, both their religious beliefs and their politics come from a place of um, affect, like these, these sort of deeply felt beliefs um, of which there isn't sort of reason that can that can challenge them. And I think um, this can sort of serve a collective effervescence in terms of a religious community, but it also means that um, messages that sort of line up to their feelings about truth or the way the world should be can, can find resonance. And so I think that, you know, in the communities that I've studied that seem close to fringe groups like QAnon, um, they certainly don't see themselves as fringe and they certainly don't see themselves as um, being sort of anti-knowledge or anti-science, um, but that their sources sort of come from a, a different, come from a different place. So I do, I mean, I think that um, I, I think it's, it's a mistake to say that fringe groups like QAnon are sort of over there and other online communities are somewhere else because um, that that there are similarities that you know would be fruitful. I'm looking forward to the research that comes from you know studying those communities as as spaces that um, may overlap with those that that I study or that we've talked about today. Th 
Thanks, Kelsey. Here's um, finally um, just our last question comment. This is um, from um, the perspective of a local pastor. Um, technology has also been an integral tool of growing the church. Um, and um, this person gives examples and says, currently we use Zoom and Facebook Live. My experience has been that the tools when used appropriately have helped congregations grow, grow closer, deeper in their faith thinking and more diverse. My question is what studies are happening during this most recent pandemic regarding church growth? And this question is from Pastor Chuck Kelsey. So any, any comments on that? Um, um, what is the research showing about, um, um, about how technology and the use of you know, Zoom and Facebook Live is affecting um, congregational life? Well, there's been one recent study that I found pretty interesting uh, that said um, many churches, Black churches, were now engaging in uh, hybridized forms of worship, a little online and a little um, uh, in person. Um, and I, I think of that as really gelling with traditional modes of survival in Black church communities and, and um, having to become innovative. Um, I also, uh, as I said before, think about its connections to wider church practices and why looking at traditions within the Black church becomes so important because those become traditions more broadly um, as Black church culture continues to affect American Christianity and other uh, religious traditions. Um, so I, I would say that's one of the, the important ones, but I, I actually think there needs to be much more research, particularly on Black religion and technology use uh, than what's been done. Even some of the really great studies coming out of uh, Pew Research Search um, does not engage fully the use of technology um, in Black religious expression. So I, I think that's, that's some outstanding work. And my next project. <laughs> I'll just mention, you know, from some of my own observations, both in South Korea and the United States during the pandemic, is that I, I think if we're talking about the effect of technology during this period, we also need to talk about the kind of economic effects of the pandemic and the K-shaped recovery, um, so-called. I think that that um, says a lot about like what I have observed happening with churches. There has been Largely churches that were already accustomed to these, these forms of mediated uh, you know, religious services have done really well and have actually grown in terms of giving and in terms of the size of their congregation. But often that comes at the expense of smaller churches that are less equipped to, um, to, to make that leap into the digital or that might have had an aging population that's just less comfortable doing online worship. Um, and so while some churches have grown, yeah, we have to look at how they have maybe absorbed congregants from, from other places and so on and so forth. I don't know specifically how many kind of new converts or new attendees of churches have emerged during the pandemic, um, but that would be interesting to study for sure. Thank you, this is so, so helpful, both of you. Um, um, Pastor Kelsey, you might want to check out um, the Hartford Seminary is, do, has, is uh, doing an ongoing study of how um, churches have changed during the COVID pandemic. So you might want to check out their website or you could just email me and I could lead you towards that some of that data. But I want to just thank all of our panelists today um, for such a um, wonderful and thought-provoking conversation about the role of new technology and religion. Um, thank you for joining us, um, everyone in the audience as well, um, and hope to see you at the next Matrix event.